Welcome, everyone. I hope you are all doing well uh, today. Before we start the presentation, I would like to share what we've been up to at Hardware IO. Uh, now we are less than a month from our upcoming Germany trainings. Uh, if you haven't checked them out yet, please do so on our website. You can find more information about it. And if you have more questions, just feel free to send us an email. A second announcement is that last week we have opened our CFP for our upcoming online Hardware IO USA conference. If you have an awesome research or an, an open security tool that you would like to present, feel free to submit your uh, ideas. I will share with you the link for the CFP in the chat box later on. Today, we have Sue and Douglas with us uh, from Riverloop Security. Sue works as an electrical engineer and a cybersecurity researcher, while Douglas is a senior cybersecurity researcher. In their presentation, they will address DPM attacks, more exactly decoding, understanding, and manipulating the LPC protocol. Today's webinar, as usual, will uh, uh, consist of a 30-minute technical talk followed by a 10-minute Q&A. Please, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat box and we will answer them after the presentation is over. Um, without further delay, I would like to invite you to start your presentation. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Sure. All right, that should hopefully be working well. Yes. So good afternoon. Yeah, excellent. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on TPM attacks, decoding, understanding, and manipulating the LPC protocol. Um, I'm Sue Mohideen as an electrical engineer and cybersecurity researcher at Revolut Security. And today I'm also joined by Doug Goddard, a software engineer and cybersecurity researcher, also at Riverloop. And at Riverloop, we perform embedded system security research, help commercial customers secure their embedded products, and also deliver results on federal programs. Today, we'll be presenting research that we have performed on the Trusted Platform module. And this material is based upon work supported by DARPA under the Safeguards Against Hidden Effects and Anomalous Trojans and Hardware Program, also known as SHEATH. And we'd like to thank them for their support of this research. And before we begin, um, we'd also like to note that the views, the opinions, and the findings expressed here today are those of the Revolut team and should not be interpreted as representing the official views or policies of the Department of Defense um, or the United States government. So during this talk today, we will discuss some of the complexities of the supply chain and the potential implications when it comes to hardware implants. And we will also be giving uh, background on the trusted platform module and its communication protocol. We will then be sharing our method for developing an interposer that decodes the traffic between the TPM and the server, and one that is also capable of disrupting specific TPM functionality. And we will then end with a demonstration of how this interposer works and also touch upon some future work. So with that, um, let's get started. So today's electronics are complex to design and build, which has resulted in an equally complex supply chain where individual components are handed off multiple times between manufacturers, system integrators, suppliers, and vendors. And that all leads to multiple stages where nefarious actors can introduce hardware trojans, ones that are specifically designed to remain hidden and undetectable in post-manufacturing tests and only act when triggered. And it is inherently difficult to detect an implant in complex commercial off-the-shelf systems or cost systems for short. And that's particularly when compounded by the fact that there are a lot of non-malicious component variations between devices. And a great example of this is seen here in the side-by-side -side image of the same location on two models of the same device. And although there are relatively few confirmed malicious hardware trojans um, out there in the wild, the research and the current understanding of their mechanisms of action vary quite significantly, um, which makes it even more challenging to detect them. These hardware trojans can be designed to do multiple things. They can be designed to modify firmware, modify data in transon serial bus, sniff or exfiltrate data. Uh, and that also includes uh, exfiltrating um, crypto keys. And with that, they also come in different forms. 
So they can be seen as external um, and perform packet sniffing on network cables. They can also be as physical peripherals and perform keystroke logging over USB, or they can be as PCB implants, either as additional chips on the board or as modified chips. Alternatively, they can also be as SOE, SOC implants, meaning inside um, the chip. And the question then becomes, well, how do we protect our systems against hardware implants? And we know that there are many existing hardware quality assurances in place, like imaging, X-ray, JTAG, and a few others. But none of these techniques actually seek to detect malicious variations between components. And that leaves us with a gap. And DARPA Sheath program recognizes this issue and seeks to develop real-time detection against hardware trojan um, in complex COT circuit board. And we as the Riverloop team developed proof of concept hardware implants to facilitate the testing and evaluation of the program's detection systems. So when we presented with this research opportunity, we were really interested in targeting hardware that works in conjunction with firmware. And a gre great test case that met the spec is the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM for short. And what the TPM is, it is a small hardware module with memory and secured cryptographic key storage, such as endorsement key, storage root key, and attestation identity keys. And it has now become widely used in enterprise-grade servers as well. And the module is also a cryptographic coprocessor that can quickly perform crypto functions and also provides pseudo-random number generation. And the TPM has several capabilities and functionalities. And one of its applications is kind of is its facilitation in the to the secure boot process. And secure boot, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is a signature and a hash checking mechanism that validates every stage of the boot process. And this process starts with the one-time programmable memory, which we understand to be immutable and provides the core root of trust which is then followed by the first stage bootloader signed with the manufacturing key, uh, followed by additional signed bootloader stages, and then the signed OS or operating system. And the way in which the TPM works in conjunction with secure boot is with its uh, platform configuration registers or PCRs. And the PCRs are one of the essential features of a TPM. Their prime use case is to provide a method to cryptically cryptographically record a software state. And by that, I mean, it's the state that is both for the software that is running on the platform, as well as the configuration data used by that software. So with secure boot, the TPM takes a hash at each stage of the process. And these hash values are then extended until the boot process is complete. And then these can then be signed to return a more secure report, um, which is referred to as, as an attestation. And one thing I'd like to note here is that the TPM itself does not assess how good the measurements are. So internally, it does not know which measurements are good and which measurements are bad. At the time of measurement, the TPM PCRs just record values and the security and the trust comes later. When in this case, the application is secure boot, uses these PCR values um, in an authorization policy and asks for the signed attestation of these values. Um, and judges their trustworthiness. So that is one of the functionalities of the TPM. Another functionality of the TPM is that it is a secure random hardware provider, which means that it can be used to circumvent possible flaws in OS-based RNGs or be used for random data to seed the creation of cryptographic keys on the host. And this functionality is one that we are really interested in when we're brainstorming possible attacks on the TPM. Um, because being able to undermine this mechanism can lead to failed or flawed key gen and ultimately harm communication security and, and integrity. And also just kind of thinking about the bigger picture here, uh, an attack on the TPM in a more general sense or any compromise to the TPM would also inherently be somewhat undermining the secure boot process. So for all of these different reasons, along with the fact that the TPM is kind of a removable module, making it really a an attractive or appealing attack surface, our attack choice was to kind of compromise the TPM and be able to disrupt um, some capability um, or, and functionality of it, particularly that of the random, random number generation, all while not interrupting the secure 
boot process. And that was kind of the goal that we set to achieve. And I would just like to reiterate here that the attack that we'll be dem demonstrating was designed to kind of explicitly empower um, defenders to develop innovative detection methodologies against practical attacks on enterprise grade hardware. So how do we do this? So the approach that we took was to place an interposer in between the TPM and the host server, as you can kind of see in this image here. And with this interposer person in the middle kind of um, set up, it allowed us to actively sniff um, and also be able to decode the TPM Intel low pin count or LPC bus traffic, and also be able to track the TPM um, logic state in real time. And the research that uh, we'll be presenting here also references some past research done by NCC Group on their TPM Genie, which they used um, on the target, um, which they use to target I2C based TPMs. But here we'll be targeting the low pin count or LPC bus. So when it kind of came to designing this interposer, one of the things that we really needed to pay attention to and was honestly quite difficult and a challenge to work with is kind of the high speeds of this bus, um, which, is, um, which operates at 33.3 megahertz. And kind of for dealing with this high speed signals, we chose to implement our interposer on an ICE-40 uh, Lattice FPGA, which can deal with these high speed signals of the server and also just has an interoperable layout that made it really ideal for quick prototyping. And before I jump in and kind of explain our electrical setup, I wanted to talk a little bit about the low pin count or the LPC bus, what it is and how it works to kind of give a better context um, before moving forward. So the LPC bus provides the base communication protocol for the TPM. The interface itself performs memory, IO, DMA, and bus master cycles. And there are seven key signals to this uh, bus. And that includes clock, um, which runs at 33.3 megahertz, um, L-frame or the start of frame delimiter, which indicates the start of every new cycle, uh, reset, and then the four LAD uh, signals, which are the bi-directional um, and ad memory data, memory, and addressing lines. And if we look to the figure to the right here, that kind of captures a typical TPM communication cycle. So what happens is that when frame is asserted high, the state machine starts and the cycle type is driven by the host. And then that is followed by the address or the memory field, and then the turnaround state, which turns control over to the peripheral. And then that is followed by the wait or the sync state, then the data field, and then finally the turnaround signal once again, which kind of turns control back over to the host. And we found that being able to distinguish between all these different stages or states in, the, um, in this communication cycle was really a key to be able to decode the TPM signals and kind of communication, which also later allowed us to simulate some attacks. So as I previously mentioned, the goal here was to be able to compromise the TPM and have control over its random number generation. So to do that, we kind of uh, recognized that our setup, um, special electric, we had to be able to do a few things. One, it had to be able to actively sniff the data so that we can decode those signals. And two, it also had to act as a pass through in all cases, unless when it's triggered. And lastly, it also had to be able to control the logic of the control lines, um, specifically that of the L-frame signal um, since controlling that also controls the flow of the communication cycle. So to kind of achieve those specifications, um, what we did is that we connected the L-frame and the clock signals from the TPM and the host side separately into the FPGA, which allowed us to have control over those lines. And then we had the data lines remain connected directly between the host and the TPM, and then branch those signals into the FPGA to allow us to sniff those data lines. And with this setup, um, we were able to modify the L-frame uh, line logic states based on a number of different inputs. Uh, and the most important one being a decoded byte sequence, um, which Doug will talk about in just a minute here. And by that, I mean, we can be able to pull L-frame low um, and disrupt communication when a certain byte sequence is decoded. 
And that byte sequence, to be a bit more exact, is in reference to that of the random number generation request, which Doug will walk us through in just a second here. And controlling L frame, which is the start of frame delimiter, is really powerful because with that, we're able to cause disruptions in TPM operations, um, including that of the random number generator. And with this kind of electrical setup, we achieved, I think, also one of the most important and critical things, which is that the interposer acts as a pass through unless it is triggered. And what that allows is that the TPM just behaves normally as if there was no interposer present and it's not even aware that there's anything connected to it. And the beauty in that is that it allows for secure boot to occur without any interruptions, which I think is a really cool feature of this electrical setup. So with that, I will pass it on to Doug, who will kind of walk us through the software behind this FPGA-based interposer. Okay. I'll share my screen here. The slide should be up. So yeah, I will start by talking a little bit about the LPC specification. And as Stu's gone over a little bit, um, these are kind of the different uh, frames you see in the LPC spec. So the start of the interaction is L frame gets pulled low and the data lines get driven 0101. And that's actually a TPM specific start delimiter. Um, it's like a reserved field in the normal LPC spec, but TPM uses that one specifically. So you can just look for that. Um, and then there's a direction frame or a direction interaction where uh, for read, a zero in the second bit is driven across the data lines. And for a write, a one in the second bit is driven across the data lines. Um, the least significant bit is actually undefined in this case. Uh, there's an address field, which is two bytes. So it is driven over the data lines over four clocks. So one nibble per uh, clock cycle. Um, there's also the turnaround where the data lines are driven high for two clock cycles and that will transfer uh, control from either the host to the device or the device to the host. Um, after the turnaround, after the interact, or yeah, after controls transferred from the host to the device, uh, sync messages are sent and they're like the device can stall for a little bit. So it can be giving like sync wait, sync wait, sync wait. And then finally it will be driven low. The data lines will be driven low for one clock. Um, and that means that the, it's ready to proceed basically. And then the data can be, will be coming across the uh, data lines um, as one byte delivered over two clocks. So the actual order for these differs based on if it's a read or write. Um, and this is a little bit simplified from the full capabilities of the LPC spec and the TPM, um, but these are what we saw in practice. So for an example, read would be a start, and then you'd get the direction read, uh, you would get the address that's being read from, and then a turnaround to transfer control to the, the device. The device would then sync, um, give the data for that read address, and then turn around back to the host, and that would terminate the transaction. The write is very similar. You'd get a start, and then the direction write. You'd get the address that's being written to, the data that's being written, and then a turnaround, um, and the device would simply sync and then turn around to terminate the transaction. So these are some of the, yeah, I guess the, the issue we faced was starting to understand this. And so these are traces that Sue collected from a logic analyzer with the TPM going, going across. Um, and my job was to figure out how to decode these. Um, and the way I did that was exporting them to CSV and then working in a language that I was familiar with because I was learning LPC and FPGA during this. Um, and doing these both at the same time would be really difficult. So I processed the CSVs in Go, uh, and that, that allowed me to begin to understand the LPC uh, format. So the processing those out, we begin to get the actual TPM bytes. So those complete interactions of the writes and reads, um, we end up with like a write of a specific address and the data that's being written. Um, and then from that, you can begin to pull out the TPM spec. Um, so here we actually see the TPM protocol where C1 is a request starting, and then you have the size of the request, uh, you have the ordinal for get random, and then you have the number of bytes being requested. 
And then the response is you get a tag response, you get the size of the response, you get the number of bytes that are being responded, and then you get your random data. Um, so that's the kind of higher level TPM protocol that you pull out after you start decoding the LPC protocol. So our goal for the interposer now is to do perform byte matching to, under, to know when we want to trigger the implant. And specifically, we're going to match on these bytes and there can be other interactions between these. So we kind of just need to, uh, I believe the words contiguously, but just check for each byte and kind of let them build up as they go. So we'll check for a C1, we'll check for a zero E, we'll check for this ordinal and we'll check for the number. And then on the next uh, start frame where we, after we see this C4, we're going to uh, see the next start frame, which would probably be this null read. Um, and then we're actually going to pull the L frame low and kill the transaction. So uh, now I had the easy task of porting this code to Verilog. Um, and I thought this was going to be much easier than it was because Verilog looked very much like a programming language, but uh, it is not. It is a trap for software engineers. It's a hardware description language, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, and this has actually some really cool features. So everything is parallelized, which when you're thinking kind of an imperative programming mindset is not what you'd expect. Um, but once you get your head around it, it's a very cool way to build, uh, yeah, build functionality. Um, the thing that I was very bad at was interfacing with electricity. Um, so yeah, even getting just some information out of the FPGA, uh, I had to like do binary over LEDs. Like I didn't have a great way to kind of leak information and understand what was happening. So big thanks to Sue there for handling a lot of the electricity stuff. Um, but kind of the saving grace here is test benches. So when you're developing FPGA code, um, the test benches are really your friend and they help you simulate what's going on and kind of prove that what you're doing is correct as long as your test benches are also correct. Um, so porting this to the Verilog code, this is kind of what we end up with. It's a, just a state machine. Um, <clears throat> and this is after a few inter iterations. So I actually have nice like uh, defined variables now. Um, but we can see it kind of starts at a none state. We see the start delimiter. We move into the start state, which is actually reading the direction. We read the direction, then we transfer the state to the reading the address um, and so on. And I'll, I'll show that a little bit more when I show the code. Um, but that that is kind of where it ended up. And yeah, like all of these kind of uh, variable updates are happening in parallel per the clock cycle. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the functionality and the targets for attack. So the first idea was to uh, attack the secure boot process. Um, and so that would have been interposing the PCR extend um, because that is not authenticated. And that is really kind of what the building off the NCC group research, or that, that's an idea that came from kind of the NCC group research. Um, and so that was very difficult, though, because we did have to interpose all the data lines as well. Um, and just as you added that complexity, uh, it kind of it started to kind of fall apart. But for interposing the PCR extend, the basically the you would work in conjunction with a backdoor uh, firmware or bootloader, and as that's being verified, the known malicious hash could be replaced with a known good hash. So the final PCR value uh, would appear valid. So the way PCR works, it's just kind of like a running SHA-1 hash. Um, so you would hash the first thing, or it would start with zeros. You would hash the first thing. Um, and then as you hash consecutive, or yeah, consecutive parts of the boot process or pieces of code that are uh, critical to the boot process, uh, you would just kind of keep updating that SHA-1 hash and extending it. Um, so the malicious one could be replaced with a good one and you would kind of have a final good output. Um, what we ended up on is targeting the git random. Um, so that basically allowed us to kill the transaction. So if in that case, the hardware interacting with the software could, uh, you could interact with a known, or yeah, a malicious piece or a malicious key generator and kind of signal to it when it could, um, 
start replacing or yeah start replacing or like have a functionality fail uh, so that a weakened key could be used uh, rather than the hardware secured key. So I will slide over to the demo now. Um, so hopefully everyone can see Ubuntu yell at me if you cannot. Um, but the, so yeah, this is, this is the Verilog code. The state machines down here and we kind of go from go through those states and get to start, we get to address, um, address depending on the direction. We can either go to a turnaround if it's a read or send data if it's a write. Um, the turnaround is similar uh, split where it's gonna sync if it's the device um, or, or yeah, sync if it's the, or go and expect to sync if it's coming from the host to the device and then terminate the transaction if it's going from the device to the host. Um, the sync either moves into a data or tar the data goes for two clocks and grabs the uh, data line one nibble at a time or the data one nibble at a time. Um, and yeah, it can always, it can go and reset. So this is kind of tracking the states. And then what's actually occurring is when we have actual data um, to look at, depending on the direction, we're going to be matching it against a sequence of bytes. So this hideous piece of code. This used to be done in an array, but uh, in an attempt to try to uh, get the FPGA to not be using memory, uh, they all went into variable defines. So those are, these are the byte sequence we're matching up here. So we're seeing that tag request, we're seeing the size, um, we're seeing the ordinal get random, and then we're seeing the response. So as we go through those, uh, will be updating an index. And then when the index reaches the end of this, so when it's 10, we're actually gonna be looking for the start of the next frame so that we can kill it. Um, so that'll go around. And then once we see the new start, we'll be pulling L frame low for 50 clocks uh, just to make sure everything dies. So that is the FPGA code. So then the test bench uh, kind of goes, builds off of that. Um, you instantiate the mod module, and then we're going to have this data that we're going to iterate through, send across the lines, and then that will uh, test if the interposer is working correctly. And we did get this running on real hardware too. We don't have access to that today, so you get to see the test benches. Um, so it runs through the writes first. The zero through nine on here is going to be writes, and then this is going to be kind of the read back. Um, so it goes through the writes. It basically does the start of frame, the uh, direction, the data, or the address, um, the data, and then the turnaround, the sync turnaround. Um, and then for the read similar, it simulates all that stuff. So we can go and run the simulation there um, and we can see this stuff coming across. So we see our start of frame, which is 0101. Um, and this has an input and an output. So we can see kind of what's going in and what the FPGA is responding with. Um, we have a direction, which is gonna be a right. We have our address, which I used ABD7. Whoops. Oh no, um, let me just reopen this because I did a weird Zoom thing. Um, ADD7 here, because that kind of looks like address. And then we have our data coming across C1, um, the turnarounds, the, this is actually a short wait is this 0101 and then we have the sync for zero um, and then we're gonna have the turnaround again and a new transaction will start. So we go through these and we see enough bytes. And then finally, when we see the C4 byte, um, even though the L frame down here is still high, uh, we see that the interposer is pulling it low now. Um, and so that's gonna kill the transaction um, and signal to the software key generator that we wrote uh, to replace the keys. So that is the demo. Um, so for future work, while we were building this, uh, what really came to mind is that this would be a lot easier if we just implemented our own TPM. Um, and I'm sure I'm vastly underestimating the amount of work that that would be. Uh, but I think building a full FPGA based soft TPM um, would be a bit easier than kind of uh, make, managing all the electronic lines here. Um, there's also a lot of other platforms that would be really interesting to target. Um, you have Java smart cards, you have U2F tokens, 
they're both kind of these like black boxes where that we rely on for very critical infrastructure. I think one of the most interesting ones would be a network card um, because these are going to be plugged into PCIe. So you'll have direct memory access and then you also kind of have a remote attack surface there, a remote access surface there. Um, you could also target neural net accelerators. Um, you can imagine a situation where a uh, certain image is not being matched when it should. Um, and then also, of course, soft core processors. Uh, you could add instructions and have other hidden things that are difficult to detect. So yeah, with the kind of global supply chain at this point, um, this stuff is a serious concern for kind of just all of our infrastructure. Like um, we, we see the battles going on with whether it's like 5G deployments in Europe um, or yeah, defense critical parts in America or yeah, things getting shipped overseas, getting interdicted. Um, yeah, so with that, I will open this up to questions. All right, thank you, Sue and Douglas for the, for the presentation. We got a few questions in the chat box. I will read them out loud to you. Um, so Bartos is asking, is hash used in uh, TPM boot signing indeed SHA1, uh, uh, since that is considered weak nowadays? So I believe the TPM2s have multiple hash functionalities. So I think you can ask it for a SHA-256. Um, but it's been a while since I've looked at the PCR extend stuff, but I believe that's still SHA-1. Um, but yeah, I, I, on TPM2, I think I saw the option to do other hashes. All right, thank you. Uh, he also has another question. How is uh, hardware PRNG in TPM better than software implemented PRNG? Um, I mean, people, yeah, I, I see that and I like, yes, you can audit the software a lot more easily. Um, and that's kind of the crux here is that, how do you audit these kind of hardware devices? But say you have something like a rootkit um, or something that's uh, man in the middle in kind of your binary interface or your API toward that software RNG, um, that's not necessarily going to be auditable. Um, yes, you can go look at the software RNG code, but maybe there's something running on also a very complex system. So uh, I think that was really the crux of the sheaf program was to see um, how to actually audit these hardware devices. And perhaps that could be easier and more reliable than, than auditing a full operating system. All right, thank you. Um, as I see, there's another question uh, from Paul. He's asking, what were you, your design constraints that led you to choose the IS-40 FPGA instead of a Zillings or Altera device? Um, when I started on this, the IS-40 was supported by the open source tool chain, um, the Yosis and kind of that, that group of things. So that's what I chose. Um, so all this was built kind of on that open source stuff. And that's actually a design decision uh, we were moving off of toward the end. And we were looking, we were, yeah, looking at uh, more professional build systems. Um, Stu might have some other things to say about the electronics. Yeah, there, I mean, definitely dealing with the IT40, there was like some parts that worked in our favor really well, like just having all the different uh, connections possible and LEDs um, really allowed us to kind of debug and prototype uh, really quickly. But I think towards the end, we were kind of like exploring if there would be kind of, as Doug mentioned, like some better FPGAs. One of the things that we were dealing with as well was kind of like altering the clock speed to match it. That was something that we were able to kind of do towards the end as well. So with that, like it was something that I think because Doug had a little bit experience too with Yosis and all of that, it was kind of nice to just jump into that, but kind of towards the end, we were a bit open into changing that as well. So we shall see if we continue, we'll see which direction we go to. All right, thank you. Um, Bartos made a comment uh, saying, not sure who generates clock signal for response. If this is TPM module, having control over clock line, 
uh, MITM scenario could be abused to slow down LPC communication, then regular microcontroller could probably be used as decreasing entry point for any attacks. That would be cool. I think the host is the one driving the clock. Yep. Um, and uh, Catalina is asking you, what future work are you looking at? Um, yeah, I think I think the cool immediate future work would be a full FPGA based TPM, but uh, I'm still sure I'm vastly underestimating how much work would go into that. So uh, we'll see. We'll see there. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, if you have any questions, please send them across the Zoom chat. All right. Um, Travis is asking you, is the Verilog code available open sourced? Uh, it is not right now, but we can, I will talk with Riverloop people about getting that up. Um, so I guess look out for a blog post or something on that, uh, but we'll probably have to go through like a release cycle and stuff given uh, the program it was developed under. But yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> All right. Nice. All right. Then uh, thank you for your webinar. I think it was uh, an interesting one with uh, a lot of questions, I see. Um, guys, please don't forget to fill in the feedback form and share your experience with us. Uh, it would be also great if you'd give uh, Sue and Douglas a shout out on social media. And uh, also don't forget to check out our upcoming webinar, NCFP. Uh, which you can find more info on our website. Uh, Sue and Douglas, thank you once again for your presentation. And uh, guys, see you next week. Bye. See you. Thank you I for hosting. You.